What's up guys, my name is Jack Thompson. Welcome to College Tropicals. I'm a third year animal science major attending college right now. Um, and I guess one thing that a lot of us animal science majors, and I guess any biologically focused majors, uh, are good at or have to do constantly is absorb research papers. You know, we're constantly going through, uh, kind of accumulating information and, and regurgitating it in a way that uh, makes sense uh, to others. So I thought I'd kind of transfer that over to my personal collection. Um, right now I keep mainly New Caledonian geckos, dart frogs, and a few Aussie pythons. Um, I guess I'd start off with one of my favorite gecko species, um, one that I've been keeping for a while now, uh, and that's the gargoyle gecko. Uh, so I thought I'd do like a, like a deep dive of sorts, um, and kind of go on Google Scholar and mess around, see what I can find uh, on the natural history of the gecko, and see how uh, we can kind of apply that to uh, Karen Captivity. Uh, it's not something that I think a lot of people are doing right now. I think a lot of people kind of just go online, they, they look up you know, basic care guides, and they kind of just run off, you know, whatever the article says. Um, I'd like to kind of go a little bit deeper, uh, look at, you know, kind of like the exact picture of where you can find these geckos, just because it's not, you know, super available information. You got to do a little bit of digging. So I thought I'd do that digging for y'all uh, and see what I can come up with and see how uh, I can apply that to uh, their setup and care. Um, so later in the video, we're going to be going through kind of how I'm going to set up uh, one of my babies um, uh, in a little 12, 12, 18, um, and kind of taking note of all the things that we find online, and uh, and yeah, uh, I guess we'll get to it. The best article I was able to dig up on, on gargoyle geckos and their habitat is titled The Autocology of Rachidactylus erythiolatus, a natural history study of gargoyle geckos uh, by Joshua P. Snyder. Um, this was published in 2007, although I think the information used in here is still pretty pertinent um, and can be used. Um, so in the article it states that within its range, Rachidactylus auriculatus occur primarily in ultramythic areas, which may have some connection to its distinctive diet. Uh, gargoyle geckos occur both in humid forest and MAQUIS? 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 Uh, basically, a shrub-dominated habitat underlain by ultramythic substrates. Unlike Rachidactylus chihua <laughs> in Rachidactylus lichianus, shows its time here a little bit, uh, which are generally found high within the canopy of primary forest or on large trees, Rachidactylus auriculatus utilizes shrubs, saplings, and strand vegetation and is often found within a few meters of the ground. Interesting. So the industry standard right now for gargoyle gecko care uh, in husbandry is to keep them exactly like crested geckos. Um, you need to keep them uh, with a lot of cork, a lot of dense plant growth, super humid, uh, and not very hot. Um, kind of akin to a jungle. Um, as we can see, gargoyle geckos are much more of a shrubland species. Um, shrubs, uh, in, in contrast to a jungle, experience more light, generally more heat conversely. Um, Shrubs uh, usually take root in, in rocky areas uh, where there's very low nutrient substrates available, which is kind of what ultramythic means, kind of a little, little vocab word in the article there. So looking at like a gargoyle gecko or new Caledonian gecko range map here, we can see that they inhibit or inhabit very specific areas. Uh, they're not overlapping with a lot of different gecko species like Lichianus or Cresta geckos. Um, they're kind of in their own separate niche here. So looking up kind of this, this large pink area right here, um, I believe one of the areas or towns in this area is called Pinja New Caledonia. Um, so looking up images of Pinja New Caledonia, we can kind of get a, we can kind of get a glimpse into what the, the habitat might be like for these gargoyle geckos and these shrublands. Um, so as you can see in this image that we just pulled up right here, uh, yeah, really, really shrubby. There's not a lot of large leaf growth a lot of canopy growth that's blocking down that sunlight. So these geckos are going to be experiencing uh, more UV, more heat, and more direct sunlight than something like a Crested Gecko or Lichianus Gecko that's constantly in the shade. Um, we can also see kind of like the, the limbs and the, the twigs and stuff are, are very low diameter, um, nothing like, a, like the trunks of massive trees uh, in the jungle. Um, so smaller, uh, so smaller diameter uh, climbing branches might be a good thing to use in captivity too. Um, we can kind of get into that later though. Uh, looking at another image here, we can see uh, these little rocky outcroppings, kind of like what Ultra Mythic uh, in that in the article was saying, um, where these we, these rocks are getting weathered 
uh, and creating these um, low nutrient substrates where these shrubs can, can actually root into. An interesting side note um, that might be pertinent to what some keepers are, are seeing in captivity with gargoyle geckos is that, you know, like in the range map we were saying, they're not overlapping with a lot of other different gecko species, namely Leechianus geckos. Uh, Leechianus are, are coined the apex predator of New Caledonia, but these gargoyle geckos are never encountering them really, aside from this one little region here, but um, we can look at the broad scale gargoyle geckos as being the apex predator in their regions, which is interesting. Um, unlike something like a crested gecko that lives in constant fear of getting predated upon by uh, a large Leechianus gecko, these gargoyle geckos uh, don't really have a natural uh, predator. Um, you know, there are dogs and, and, you know, introduced species that are predating upon these geckos, but um, there's no natural apex predator. Uh, so some keepers in captivity, myself included, um, I see my gargoyle geckos out and about a lot more than my crested geckos during the day. Um, so when we keep them in vivariums, uh, they can actually be pretty good display animals, um, which is an inter interesting little, little side note there. And with that, let's finally get into the setup. So here I've gone ahead and prepared a little 12, 12, 18 to use for one of my juveniles just to kind of grow them out with. Um, this is one of my, uh, probably one of my nicer animals. Uh, this is guy's uh, got a nice yellow orange base and a red stripe. The camera wants to focus. Of course it doesn't. He just whacked the heck out of himself. There you guys go. Really nice color, really nice contrast. Hoping he uh, develops a lot more of that orange as he gets older. Um, his color has improved drastically since I've gotten him as well, so I have high hopes. So I've gone ahead and added a glass lid to the enclosure. Uh, this is covering about 90% of the screen on top to keep in that humidity. Looking at a weather report of Pinjan New Caledonia, uh, the test area, or the, the subject area I'm using, uh, that fell within the, the geographical range of, of the gargoyle geckos, um, humidity there is roughly 60 to 80% at all times. Uh, temperatures range from 70 uh, at night all the way up to 88 degrees during the day. Now these geckos aren't out and about during 88 degree highs. Um, they're definitely going to be in the shade during that time. So we definitely don't want to keep the tanks 88 degrees all the time. Uh, however, a nice uh, heat gradient from I'd say about 70 in the bottom um, to uh, maybe closer to uh, high 70s, low 80s in the top, uh, it would definitely benefit the gecko. So just they have that uh, ability to choose. Now this glass will also kind of help keep a heat bubble in this little top region um, with the LED producing a little bit of heat. Um, it should work out perfectly. Now in the back I've also left uh, a little bit of screen uh, so that we can use a T5 fluorescent UVB bulb uh, to provide uh, a little bit of UVB uh, should they need it or should they choose to use it um, to bask. And I'll take notes and see if uh, they actually utilize it and I'll report that most likely on my Instagram. Now for inside the tank, uh, I've started with a substrate layer of uh, Montemorillonite clay. Uh, this, doll, this stuff uh, you can buy it as safety sorb. Uh, it's like a $7 bag for about 25 pounds. Great deal. Completely safe for reptiles. Uh, it's really easy for the geckos to, to not ingest it as long as you cap it with a, um, a leaf litter layer. But it's essentially a small uh, clay substrate. Um, plants root great in it. Um, it also works really, really well for microfauna uh, because it is a clay. Um, and leaf litter goes on top and, and sits down really, really nicely as well. And they can also dig in it. So there's a lot of benefits to this stuff. Um, obviously, if you see your gecko getting mouthfuls of this stuff, be a little bit careful. Uh, it's not good for them to get you know, a lot of this stuff in their mouths, but um, they usually have an easy time uh, expelling it if they need to. I've also gone ahead and added some leaf litter. This is just some random leaf litter I found outside. Uh, baked it. So it should be good to go. I've also gone ahead and uh, acquired uh, a bunch of twigs and smaller uh, diameter branches. I've also got this big diameter branch in the middle. Um, being a juvenile gecko, they don't need the largest thing to hold on to. So I'm hoping they can wrap around this branch really nicely. Just variety is really the key to success with, with pretty much all reptiles and giving them the option to choose. So unfortunately, technology works in mysterious ways and loves to delete things. Uh, but as you can see, I've just gone ahead and added all the uh, twigs in a pretty haphazard manner. All of them are kind of angled up though, um, with a few of them kind of angling horizontally just to provide a bunch of variety as far as perching options go. Uh, but there really was no science to this. It was just throw them all in and make it look all right. 
Uh, we're not doing any kind of crazy scaping contest with this kind of tank. It's just a grow out, uh, but an effective grow out tank. Uh, only thing extra I'm going to add um, is this large uh, bird of paradise frond, um, just so they give the option to kind of hide behind these large leaves and stuff, just to get out of the limelight for a little bit. And I'm just going to kind of shove this in a little corner right here. Just gives them the option. But as you can see, he's already right at home. Um, he had a nice little time jumping around and climbing. Of course, when the camera decided to not record. But. It's important to note that the article also goes into the diet of the gorgo gecko and kind of how it relates to their habitat as well. Uh, so here it states that the diet of Rachidactylus auriculatus regularly includes various arthropods, snails, plant material, and other lizard species, including Bavaia and a name I'm not going to try and pronounce. Looking up those two uh, uh, lizard names, uh, it comes up as a small little gecko, not unsimilar to a <laughs> to a morning gecko. I promise I won't do that. Um, and a little skink species as well. Um, but relating that to how gargoyle geckos are primarily found in shrublands, in humid shrublands, um, shrublands tend to not have as much um, consumable plant, plant matter as something like a jungle would, uh, which is why that it's stated that these geckos are a lot more carnivorous, which um, when we kind of think about it, when we kind of think about it, um, if there's less uh, available fruits and plant material these geckos can consume, of course their diet's going to be comprised uh, of other things, namely uh, insects and smaller lizards. Um, so when we're thinking about care, um, we can't just feed these geckos crusty gecko diet. We need to supplement with bugs, insects, maybe not morning geckos. We love our morning geckos too much. Um, but you know, really putting on a lot of protein is really important for this species compared to something like a crusty gecko. So thanks guys for sticking around to the end of the video, if you did. Um, I hope some of the information we talked about today was a little bit thought provoking at least and it kind of inspires you to kind of do your own research uh, and, and find out as much as you can about the animals you take care of, kind of past just the care guides. Um, now as far as the YouTube channel is con uh, concerned, I'm hoping to be putting out a video at least, oh, hopefully every week, uh, very least uh, once every two weeks um, I have a lot of ideas I want to kind of translate into video um, a few more of these kind of natural history setup guides um, I want to do with some of my other animals so a few other new Caledonian geckos some dart frogs uh, some Australian pythons uh, if you're interested um, and yeah if you like the content uh, make sure to subscribe like comment please I need feedback um, any feedbacks, you know, greatly appreciated. Share if you feel like it. Um, and yeah, thanks for sticking around, y'all. Cheers.